what's up what's up what's up beautiful people beautiful nepal and good day beautiful people so so welcome back to me welcome back to my channel and now i'm going to a uh, reaction of about beautiful country of nepal so now is a uh, is a uh, geography yeah this is geography so this video is created by geography now so i want to learn about more of a uh, country of nepal so let's see you know, after I made the India video, I got a lot of Nepalese people yes. saying... You made a mistake. Buddha was not born in India. He was born in Lumbini, which is in oh. Nepal. To which many of the Indian subscribers were like... Eh, yeah, but Buddhist texts say he grew up in Kapilavatsu for the first 29 years of his life. Which is probably in Piprahawa, which is like a half a mile away from the Nepali mm. border. Lies! Kapilavatsu is most likely in modern-day Talarika. Okay, well, even if that was true, it was during the Mahajanapada era. Modern-day Nepal wasn't even established. So does it really count for Nepal? Yes! Yes, it does! Yeah, this is kind of a big deal for them. Yes. Very, very big it's deal to them. Geography. No! Hey everybody, I'm your host, Barbs. Alright, so what do you know about Nepal? Mount Everest, yes. right? Yep, keep going. Sherpas! Uh, sure. Anything else? Sherpas on Mount Everest. And that's my cue to begin the lesson. Let's look at some maps now, shall we? Yes. Nepal is often called the roof of the world. About 75% of the entire country is in the highest mountain chain on Earth. This means they have a very interesting civil layout. Yes. First of all, the country is landlocked, located in South Asia, sandwiched right in between India and China, Whoa. locked away predominantly within the Himalayan mountain range. The country is divided into seven, seven provinces, provinces. Only three of which have actual names, whereas the remaining four are just called province with the corresponding number. Some of these provinces have proposed names, but as of 2019, Whoa. they are not seven yet official. Provinces. Number four is skipped because they gave Gandaki a name back in 2018 when it used to be province 4. Wait, so if 4 is gone now, why don't they just switch 5 to 4? Eh, paperwork is hard. Plus, it might get a new name soon anyway, so why bother? Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, the province subdivision is relatively new. Up until 2015, they actually had 14 zone. zones, which even though they were displaced, they are still used today for license plates. The capital, Kathmandu, is located in province, province. 3, although it is yes. not the capital of the province. Hetuada is. The country's largest, busiest, and only international airport is Kathmandu's mm -hmm. Tribhuvan International. However, to relieve capacity constraints due to high tourism, work is being done to extend and make three more international hubs. Nijga Pokhara and Gautam Buddha Airport. Oh, and keep in mind they have the most dangerous airport in the world at Tenzing Hillary or Lukla Airport, Whoa. in which the runway runs off a cliff. So basically, if you don't build up enough momentum and become airborne, you oh, free fall yeah. to your death. No joking, it's true. Now here's the thing, Nepal has always kind of been like the buffer between the two giants, India and China. This in return has been both a blessing and a curse. Blessing in that nobody could really touch them, and therefore they remained one of the few countries that were never colonized. Influenced? Yes. Invaded? Yes. But colonized? No. This in return has made Nepal's land transport network very unique. Multiple roads enter into Nepal from India and China, but if you want to get to the economic hub Kathmandu, you have to go into the heart of the mountains, and your options are limited only to a few main high Highways, like the HO2 from Raksau, India, and the HO3, which goes into Changmujin, Tibet, China. If you look closely in the west, though, you'll find Nepal's only disputed area, the Kalapani right, territory. territory. Basically, it was a byproduct of the 1962 border war with India and wow. China. Things got messy, and to this day, Nepal claims that the river to the west should be their border, but India claims that the ridge line to the east should be theirs. Well, for what it's worth, though, there are tons of cool places to check out in case if you decide to visit, such as the Anapura National History Museum, Narayana Tea Palace, the city of Pokhara is kind of like the tourism capital, the island jungle resort of Chitwan, the tiger tops wow. and elephant polo field, the toothache tree, the aircrafts museum, so many religious sites okay. like these temples, the Rongbuk monastery, wow. and probably the most notable sites being Lumbini, Lumbini. the birthplace of Buddha, and Buddhanath Stupa. Whew, yeah, lots of things were built and happened here in the mountains. Mountains make a great fortification against outside forces, especially when they are really tall. Let's talk more about the mountains, shall we? Now, how can I put this simply? Nepal's physical land makeup is kind of like the share price of Apple's stock in the beginning of the 2000s. You know, it's like... 
First of all, Nepal is located right at the start of the Himalayan mountains, the tallest range on Earth, which was basically formed by the Indian tectonic plate smashing into the Eurasian plate. The collision is still occurring to this day, which means that the Himalayas grow about 2.4 inches or 6.1 centimeters every year. This means that every new person to reach the summit temporarily becomes a world record holder. Obviously, you all know the highest point can be found here Mount too, Everest. Mount Everest or Sagarmata, the tallest mountain in the world shared with China at nearly 9,000 meters high. Keep in mind, eight of the 10 tall mountains in the world are actually found in Nepal as well. Also keep in mind, due to the tectonic plate convergence, the country is subject to occasional earthquakes, one of the most well-documented ones being a 7.8 magnitude quake with aftershocks hitting the capital, destroying ancient sites back in 2015. In addition, it triggered an avalanche on Mount Everest, killing 21 people, making it the deadliest day on Mount Everest history. The Himalayas are just one of three regions of the country though. Below the Himalayan region lies the Pahad, a lower mountain region in the green zone that generally does not get snow and fosters fertile valleys and rivers. Below this is the final region, the Tarai, the lowest point in Nepal located in the greater Gangetic Plain that extends into northern India and Bangladesh. The lowest actual point being Kalan of the Japa district. After China, this makes Nepal one of the countries with the widest range of elevations on earth. This is also where most of the agriculture and produce are grown as it is the most fertile region fed by countless rivers and their tributaries that are sourced by the snowmelt from the Himalayas. The longest of these rivers, the Gagara, can be found in the west as well as the largest Lake Rara. Wow. Nonetheless, the Bagmati River is very important as it passes through Kathmandu, and the Gandak River contains the largest hydroelectric dam, and wow. the Koshi River provides irrigation to much of the valleys in the east. Phew! Mountains, rivers, lakes, valleys, earthquakes, agriculture. It seems like nature has been playing around with Nepal since day one. Alright, so that being said, it's time for my triple shot of espresso break. It's time for me to stop talking, but you know who knows a few things? Did somebody say... Noah. No. He's back! Now Nepal may have a lot of natural beauty, but the problem is they still have a quite a way to go in terms of stabilizing their living index. Today they are still a heavily agrarian society with about 65% of the workforce employed in agriculture and only about 20% of the land has been cultivated. About 30% of the GDP is dependent on remittances sent from abroad. More than half of the development budget comes from foreign aid. The largest exports are actually textiles, carpets, and clothing. Nonetheless, since the 90s, they've been really trying hard to exploit the tourism sector, and mostly through guided excursions up the many mountains with Everest being the most expensive one. It's like this. All right, Ken, you get to go up Everest, but which agency will you choose? Hi, I'm the Western agency that speaks your language and caters to all your Western needs. You'll even wake up to eggs and toast with coffee in the morning. My minimum rate goes around 45,000. Hi, I'm the local Nepali agency. I have a slight accent when I talk, and the experience might be a little rough around the edges, but you'll still get to the peak of Everest. I charge wow. only $25,000. So which one will you choose, Ken? Uh, can I just hire a helicopter for a couple hundred dollars? So far, only one person has ever done that, and it's incredibly dangerous. Yeah. Besides that, though, about 40% of the country is forested. They have nine national parks and three wildlife reserves. Nonetheless, the national animal is the cow. No surprise, the country is predominantly um, Hindu, is which reveres cows as sacred ball. animals. Many people are either vegetarian or only eat chicken and fish. Speaking of which, food! Wow. Now, there are many different people groups that have their own cuisines in Nepal, yes. and they come in all different colors and tastes. Some of the top dishes you guys, the Dragon Peep suggested, include things like Dindo, Gundruk, Dal Bas Takari, Takali Kanaset, Choila, Kachila, Tatamari, Nepali wow, style Pani Puri, Aluchana, Laping. And the one dish almost all of you okay. mentioned, momo okay. dumplings. Now the these dishes I just mentioned dumplings. came from the cuisines of the many different people groups you can find here. Nepal is just not Nepal without its people. Which brings us to... Thank you, Noah. Follow him on Instagram. No problem. So you uh, tried to film without Noah last episode, huh? Sorry, Noah. I must <laughs> apologize. Now, one thing many people don't seem to know too well is that Nepal is actually a very diverse nation with over 120 ethno-linguistic people groups. First of all, the country has about 30 million people and about 2 million absentee Whoa, citizens okay. working abroad, mostly male laborers in the Middle East. Of these ethnic groups, the largest one at about 17% are the Chetri, followed by about 12% Brahmin Hill peoples, the Magar at 7%, Taru at an additional 7%, and the rest are made up of the various 121 other people groups. They use the Nepali rupee as their currency, which is pegged to the Indian 
Rupee. They use a type C, D, and M pluck outlet, and they drive on the left side of the road. Now, linguistically, how does a country unify 125 different ethno-linguistic people groups? Well, for one, the official language of Nepal is Nepali, a cousin of Hindi, oh, natively Nepali. spoken by about 45% of the population. To simplify things, though, English is sort of used as like a lingua franca in government offices, businesses, and also within the technical, medical, and engineering scientific community. Now, here's the thing. As mentioned before, the majority of Nepal at about 81% of the country identifies as Hindu. Nonetheless, even though it's a minority religion at about 10%, Nepal takes Buddhism very seriously. It kind of yeah. started here. Now, of course, since there are so many different people groups, there isn't really one universal Nepalese culture. In general, though, most of them can be divided into seven family groups that cluster into certain regions. You have the mountainous Botia, Sherpa, and Takali peoples, way up in the northern Himalayan zones. Yes, this is where the word Sherpa comes from. Then you have the Gurung peoples, whom are kind of like the famous bodyguards of Nepal. Many wow. Gurung are Gurkhas, an elite military trained contingent force that fights for hire. Today, a couple thousand actually work for the British military. Then there's the Kiranti, yes. Rai, and Limbu peoples of the east. These people are actually culturally close to Sikkim and the Bhutanese people. They speak a similar tibeto burman language. At about three-fifths of the population, the Pahari peoples are actually the largest and most widespread people group inhabiting many of the lowlands. They are known for being heavily agrarian and having wonderfully colorful wool and woven fabrics. The Tamang are made up of about 40 clans scattered in the center and east highlands. They are also Tibeto-Burman and way more Buddhist in culture. They have beautiful gompas or monasteries in every main village. Then there's other people groups like the Taru people in the south, known for having one of the most famous cuisines in all of Nepal. They are known for generally being immune to malaria due to the genetic structure of most Taru people having thalassemic blood. Wait, thala what? Thalassemic. It's like a condition that can be inherited and helps prevent against certain diseases like malaria. Uh, so is this gonna be like a new segment like in the Namibia episode where I ask what the definition is and you explain what it is? Possibly yes. And finally, even though they make up only about 5% of the population, the one group that is kind of regarded as like the originals of Nepali national identity might be considered the Nawar peoples. Found in pockets all over, mostly in cities, they are known for being the most politically, economically, and socially advanced community in Nepal. In a nutshell with culture though, in the shortest way I can put it, you kind of see like this interesting Indian Tibetan influence fusion with Nepal. And here's random Hannah to explain. Amongst all these groups, certain traditions are shared universally, and most are either rooted in Hinduism or Buddhism or both. The Himalayas are in themselves considered the abode of Lord Shiva, and the Hindu god plays a huge role here. Many Nepalese follow a deep-rooted tantric tradition of Hinduism or Buddhism, which allows five animals for ritual sacrifice. Every town has a jatra, or celebration of main god or goddess, usually followed with a procession of the statue around the town. The 15-day-long festival of Dashin is celebrated by everyone in the country. It's a huge deal. Many of you have also mentioned the Kumari, little girls that are worshipped as living goddesses until they hit puberty and the Kumari changes. And like many other South Asian countries, marriages are usually arranged and celebrated with lavish, colorful weddings. And speaking of which, that brings us to history. Thank you, Hannah. I'll take it from here. In the quickest way I can put it, Kathmandu Valley so Neolithic fun. Age, early records of Nepal mentioned in the Vedic Hindu texts, Kirati King period, clans and small kingdoms period. This prince guy becomes a big shot. Vassal states under these empires, Mala Kingdom state period. This dude pieced it all together in what would become modern day Nepal. Anglo-Nepali War, Treaty of Sugali, Kot Massacre, Slavery Abolished in 1924, Years of Drama Between the Royals and the Democratic Experiments, Massacre in the Royal Palace, New Inherited oh. King Steps Down, Ending Nepal's Title as the Last Hindu Kingdom in the World, Unified Communist Party Wins Most Seats in the Assembly Elections, Earthquake, First Female President Voted In, and here we are today. Now keep in mind, although the ruling party is called the Communist Party, and they do hold Marxist-Leninist tenets in their policy outlook, the country is not classified as a communist country, at least in the traditional unilateral sense, but rather a parliamentary republic in which the parliament has power over the head of state, even though the parliament is predominantly part of the Communist Party. But yeah, still, it is the only country with a communist majority that is not categorically communist. Weird. Anyway, here's some famous people from Nepal. Historical figures like Amshu Verma, Princess Brikuti, Sankadar Sakwa, Araniko, Bahadur Shah, contemporary Aranika. figures like Bhimsem Tapa, Laksmi Prasad Devkota, Jamaki Miri, Amrita Acharya, Tenzig Norge, Gopal Parsad, Anil Gurung, Gaurika Singh, Dachiri Sherpa, Sandeep Lamichane, Prabal Gurung, Chandra Bahadur Dangi, David Lama, and of course, Siddhartha Gautama, otherwise known as the Buddha. Okay. All right, well that just about does it for the people. Now let's see what other people like to hang out with Nepal, or at least climb up the mountains, shall we?
Now, the Polish Isles kind of have like this very unique position in diplomatic policy. I mean, they're locked away in a very remote and rugged area on the planet, yet hold the key to so many international links. For one, even though about 10% of their country is Buddhist, other Buddhist countries like Thailand, Myanmar, and Cambodia love Nepal. Often people from these countries will take pilgrimage trips to see holy sites, especially in Lumbini. Bhutan is kind of like the only Buddhist country that they kind of have a little beef with. There was controversy over the expulsion of Nepali Lhotshampa residents back in the 90s as a means to preserve their Bhutanese culture. But today things are somewhat cooled off a bit, but there's a little bit of eye rolling. Now for best friends, yeah, most Nepalese people will probably say India or China, but it's weird because they can never have the same two best friends in the same room. China is really trying hard to win over Nepal and things only got better after the recent Communist Party took over and ended the kingdom rule. Traditionally, Nepal has always had close ties and trade with Tibet. Chinese people love Nepalese art and architecture. Tourists flock over in droves and China has been heavily investing in Nepal's transport sector with more roadways and even a train line connecting Lhasa to Kathmandu, making it one of the biggest potential engineering project endeavors the country has ever seen. For wow. India, most people will say, we love Indians, but we hate their government. Most foreign activity and trade comes through India and most people can understand Hindi. They love Bollywood films and the shared link yeah. through Hinduism has always kept these two very close. Nonetheless, India knows that Nepal depends greatly on them and sometimes when things get a little messy, they initiate economic blockades, which anger them. Usually when this happens, Nepal cozies up with China a little bit more, in which India notices and they're like, babe, I'm sorry, come back to me. I was just kidding. Nonetheless, when those two giants are bickering, Nepal kind of likes to run away off to the side and have a secret Romeo and Juliet kind of thing going on with Bangladesh. Many times when they want to go to the ocean, instead of using India's Kolkata port, they'll opt for Chittagong. Many Nepalese students study here and the two have signed a four point agreement on technical cooperation, trade, transit, and civil aviation. Nepal even agreed to provide Bangladesh with substantial energy from hydropower. It's a unique, quite interesting alliance that has only blossomed over the years. In conclusion, with wow. Nepal, you get a mountainous, Hindu, Buddhist, unexpectedly kind of communist nation with the highest point on earth, but they sure know how to be down to earth. And speaking of down to earth, yes. as in low elevation, stay tuned, the Netherlands is coming up next. Wow, this is amazing. I learned a lot of Nepal country. To be honest, I'm, I know nothing about Nepal. When I look this video, I learn a lot about Nepal country. Oh my God, this is a so beautiful country. And people, Nepalese people are probably the most down to earth and humble people in the world. That's my observations. And I have some Nepali friends and they are very, very respected people, honest, hardworking, and they are very, very good people. Yeah, I noticed that. So, in the food, wow, I love food because I love spicy also, and I love the food, especially the momo. That's my one of my favorite foods of the pile. And yeah, it's so nice. Um, also, Gorka is the famous. Uh, warrior in the world no doubt because you know it's very famous the Gorka people is very famous in the all over the world speaking of mount everest a few years ago i watched that movie the title is mount everest oh my god this is so beautiful movie i love it that that is one of my favorite movie because i love hiking adventures and yeah i watched that many times like four times five times i'm still amazed yeah that's a beautiful movie so that's all guys and thank you for yeah for your country and your beautiful country thank you. and and to beautiful people and thank you guys thank you for support my channel and please subscribe and like and share and please comment down below yeah thank you bye